second short talk actually has a bit more time, 30 minutes. OK. Yeah, uh, the Polish threat landscape by Lukasz. You have the yeah. floor. Um, my name is Łukasz Siewierski, and I work in Polish CERT, CERT Polska. And um, last time I shared with you um, malware families that we see in Poland, but we don't see uh, them anywhere else. And I'll try to uh, talk about the malware and actors behind it that we this time that we sh that we've seen this year in Poland. Uh, so I won't be talking about any clipboard re replacement like last year. We've seen um, something new, but the story behind it is that uh, the guys that w that uh, start working in Poland, uh, spreading malware and attacking computers, they usually don't have the resources that the other guys have. So, like if you have. Uh, guys that do web injects all over the, the world, they usually have the money and the resources to do it also in Poland. But the guys that start from the bottom usually don't have it and they have to be creative. So um, what we've seen is that many of the attacks are becoming more and more targeted. They are looking uh, like they were prepared specifically for some uh, for some companies, and like it says here, um, we've seen an attack where the guy sent an email that they are opening new offices in Poland, and they are looking for a lawyer or the law office that will um, that will handle the legal affairs. So the guy was really prepared. He sent an email in perfect Polish, and he also created a website where there was information about the company that he represented, and they really did something. I don't remember what was it, but they uh, really presented themselves like a multinational company, and they were s wanting to open an office in Poland. So he, he sent it to, to, to many law offices, and some of them responded because it was, well, pretty much a standard email uh, that you can get every day. So he then responded with a link to a non-disclosure agreement. He said, we cannot discuss anything uh, if you don't sign the non-disclosure agreement. And the link led to a website, uh, which I will show you later on. And it showed, uh, well, it showed basically like a PDF reader or something, and it says the document is loading. So it's all an image. It's not really a PDF reader that uh, that opened up in a browser. And then it showed you Microsoft Office splash screen that it reads the document. It's a step two. So it, uh, it prepares the document. And then it says, oh, something went wrong. You have to download this plugin in order to uh, view the document in your browser. Really. So uh, then it showed the, inst well, if you downloaded the file and you wanted to install it, it had an install shield wizard. There's apparently a thing called Microsoft Office Web App, Web App Browser Plugin. It's a real thing that you can install in, uh, I don't remember, it's Internet Explorer or something. And the guys bundled the Microsoft Office Web App Browser Plugin with malware. So it really installed the plugin. You won't see the document. You will go through the steps again. But uh, instead of the web, well, in addition to the web uh, Microsoft Office plugin, you also get a malware. So uh, this was one way of doing it. And the other way, the same guy did it, he infected some company or just bought a botnet that had that company in it. And he stole emails of all the clients of the company from the address book. And then he sent a link with an invoice saying, oh, we made some mistakes in our previous invoices to you. Can you see that invoice and uh, correct your payment or something like that? Or even uh, in one case, he sent an uh, invoice for the services performed. So uh, he he said said uh, to uh, to them, oh, oh, we're, we're sending an invoice to you, so you can pay us the amount that is disclosed in the invoice to the account that the, the, that's uh, that that's said there. 
uh, yeah, or maybe he sent an invoice and said, um, we want to pay you money, but you didn't provide us an account, so take a look at this invoice, provide account, and we will send you uh, some money for the work that you've done. And it looked pretty much the same, so then again, office, something went wrong, and, and you had malware on your computer. The guy also, as I mentioned, uh, really um, invested into the, this scheme, so he created a website for when, uh, where he sent the malware from, he created a website, and this website said that it's, it's an accounting firm uh, here. So uh, they sometimes said that they are from the company that they stole emails from, sometimes they said that they are doing accounting for the company and they are from the accounting company. Anyhow, he created a website, he got a domain, he sent all the emails from the domain. So if you wanted to check if it's a legit email, you usually check if there is a domain, if there is a company, it was all there. So you didn't have any uh, reason not to click the link, right? right? And then what he did with it is, uh, oh, well, and there's also uh, the malware downloaded another file from the domain, it's called microsoft.autoupdate.eu. So it downloaded additional file, oh, like a dropper thing, and the microsoft.autoupdate.eu looked like that. It's not a real Microsoft site. He only ripped it off from the real Microsoft site. So even if you were an administrator and you saw the connection to the microsoft.autoupdate.eu, you could go to that site and see that it's a Microsoft Download Center. So everything is okay, right? You, s you are supposed to download some exe files from Microsoft Auto Update Center. And then came the ransom note. So the guy, uh, the first malware that uh, was bundled with the Microsoft Office browser plugin was Smoke Loader. Anyone of you heard about Smoke Loader? Probably a few, right? And the smoke loader was used as a dropper, and then the dropper dropped a remote administration tool, and that remote administration tool basically stole all the files that were important for that low office or, or company. It was, well, the first batch of emails was targeted at low offices, so he stole the documents from the low offices. And then he sent an email that if you give him 500,000 euros, he will not publish those files on an online forum. And if you don't do it by the time he specified, uh, he will publish all of them. And he can also sell it to any other buyer if he wants to pay 500 euros, or for a small fee, he can remove your files from that leak. So if you were a client of the law office and you paid him, he will not publish your files. That's an interesting selling scheme, right? And uh, well, one of the law offices was hit with it, was targeted and hit, and they had like probably all of their files stolen. Um, they, made, they made even a bounty on that guy. I, I believe it was something like 10,000 euros or 10,000 10, losses, I don't remember. Exactly, but <coughs> but the uh, the funny thing is uh, that the law office was handling a class action suit against one of the banks in Poland, and that bank informed all of the clients that were part of the cl class action suit that their data was stolen, and the law office didn't. So the bank took a chance at uh, being a better company uh, and despite the fact that they were, they, they were suing the bank, he, uh, he contacted them and said, hey, your data may have leaked. Uh, which is a really smart PR move if you think about it. Okay, so uh, the question that I get asked a lot in these cases is what happens to, to the money? So uh, if you pay the guy, he obviously will take bitcoins or something, but sometimes he may just have a wire transfer and accept a wire transfer from, uh, from you. So what happens with that money? Well, in Poland, there's a, um, there's a, you can open an account if you have an account in a different bank and you make it by sending a wire transfer 
to your new account for a small fee. And if you send the wire transfer and the personal data checks out, you have a new account open. So the guys uh, had uh, real accounts from real people, and they are calling it mother accounts. And when they, they have login and password and probably an Android phone of that account, uh, they can create a mule accounts in different banks. So they have a mother account, and then they open. They say to the other bank, hey, we want to open an account with this data. Uh, can we do it? And the bank says, sure, just send a wire transfer, which will, send, which will have the sender address, the same sender address that you specified in the new account. So they open an account in a different bank and use that account so that the mother account isn't compromised. And they can open multiple Mule accounts in different banks. And while it works because usually the bank blocks a specific account and not the all accounts of the specific person, so the banks don't exchange the information about persons uh, involved in the scheme. And then you send this uh, money to the Mule account. He then Sell, buys bitcoins for it, uses some kind of laundering scheme for bitcoins, and then transfers, transfers it to prepaid cards, because uh, in Poland you used to have, at least a month ago, you could buy an anonymous prepaid card in uh, via, via mail. So you can then transfer the bitcoins to prepaid cards, and then uh, for a substantial fee, I guess it was, you can uh, get the money from the ATM. Uh, it was like, I don't remember the exact percent, but it got better with time. So if you had like uh, more funds, you could uh, easily um, get them from the ATM. And uh, when I was making this presentation, one of the colleagues of mine said that in Romania, is there someone from Romania here? Oh, yeah, one person. There is, you, maybe you can verify it, uh, there is an ATM machine that you can uh, exchange bitcoins for cash at it. Is it really the case? It's supposed to be in Bucharest. Yeah. So he says yes. We can all believe him. So, <laughs> so instead of going with the prepaid cards and so on, you can just go to the ATM and exchange bitcoins for cash. And also, in some cases, the guys just used ATMs that weren't under video surveillance. So there are some ATMs in small towns in Poland that don't have a camera on them. And you can just go there and take the money from, from it. But you, of course, need to go there. And well, it's, it's a more complex operation. And there, is, there isn't a lot of them. So that's how the money laundering works, at least in Poland. And last year, I was talking about this guy who loves to uh, copy the malware schemes. So he also loved to, co to copy that malware scheme, that ransom one. And he wrote his own dropper, because damn, that malware used the dropper, so he also had, uh, had to use one. But he doesn't have money to buy one, so he has to write, uh, write one himself. And he doesn't know how to write computer programs. So <laughs> he wrote one in .NET. And this is the whole, uh, the whole code of it. So uh, it, if you can see, it downloads one file. And if there's an exception, it downloads another file. And it also uh, tries to visit dstats.net and download a website of a person that he apparently doesn't like. So what's the idea with dstats.net? It's like a statistics website where you can uh, have, an redire have redirected to the other side, but you see how many people clicked on the link and got redirected. So he can track his campaign. And apparently, everyone, everyone else also can, because it's an open statistics. Um, yeah, so. And this is how he, what he used to send spam. Have any one of you seen this? It's like um, a weird PHP script. And well, I just thought it was fun to include. 
the second thing that we saw was uh, web injects without any malware, just to get a feeling how many of you know what a web inject is, probably a lot. Okay, so I don't have to explain. And um, what, well, what the bank saw was that the clients got infected with a social engineering attack, well, got presented with a social engineering attack, and it looked like web injects, but apparently more and more users saw this message, so it was like probably a lot of people got infected with malware, but it doesn't come to that numbers, really. Uh, so uh, it turned out that the attacker had access to the, web, to the bank web server, to the web server of the online banking system, but only to the web server, not to the infrastructure behind it. Uh, well, he had like indirect access through the web server, right? Because he, he controlled the, uh, the web server. So this guy, uh, contacted bank that he has, well, he was there for two or three months, and then he contacted the bank that he has uh, personal data, history, and he also were able to transfer some money, I believe it was uh, 250,000 euros from the accounts to his account, and then, well, the bank didn't really respond to that, so he contacted a journalist, and then the journalist contacted bank, and it worked for some time. They were contacting uh, each other via this journalist. And then uh, bank decided that uh, they won't do anything about it. They don't want it to become public. They don't want to pay their ransom. They don't want to have anything to do with this attack. So the journalist decided that he can publish a story uh, about it if the bank doesn't want to do anything about it. And the day before the story was uh, published, bank contacted the journalist and threatened a uh, law action against him and said that uh, he doesn't have any proof about the attack and he doesn't know what he's saying and basically that if he publishes anything involving that bank, they will sue him for everything he's got. Uh, so he published a, s a censored article. Uh, article was censored to the point that he didn't mention a specific bank, but he mentioned all the other stuff, so he didn't give the bank name. And the attacker got really angry and published the bank name on Tor Forum. <laughs> and it started a pretty interesting PR spiral that we will analyze here. Uh, that ended with samples of data uh, that, we, that were published on Tor Forum. So uh, this is really fun to, uh, to see what, happen what happened from the PR standpoint, what, what really, uh, ha how it went. So the first statement was to the journalist that if he publishes anything related to the hacking attempts, uh, it will be illegal, and the information is based on an uh, unreliable source and doesn't present the bank's point of view regarding the being attacked, right? So the bank didn't, well, the bank statement, statement said that they weren't attacked, and the attacker said he attacked the bank, so, you know, there's a conflict of interest there. And there were uh, lots of legal clauses here. So. Uh, the response was that the journalist, of course, included the email in the article because he wanted to present the bank's standpoint on this. And he published a dump of about 100 censored credit card data. The credit card data was censored to show that they come from the same bank, but not to show actual credit card numbers or codes or anything that could uh, lead to them being used. He published also a censored version of the wire transfers that were made without user's authorization, so they were, man, uh, they were made to Mule accounts. He also published a censored file listings from the web server, and he said that it included some of the files that the attacker put there, 
and some of the files that were, of course, expected to be on the web server, like the uh, pages that you see when you log into your uh, online bank. And he also said that he has a copy of web injects and configuration files pro for the web server. So, uh, yeah, pretty much he proved the point that they were attacked. But that wasn't enough. The bank still said that they weren't attacked, that they were hacking attempts, and they were able to, um, to stop them, and nothing was stolen. And at some point, the spokesman for the Polish Bank Association said that clients can be sure that their personal data is safe. Um, of course, Polish Bank Association is just that, is association of banks, so he may not have known the extent of the attack because the bank may not have told him what, uh, what the damage was. So uh, the attacker decided to publish personal data and history from 500 diff different uh, business accounts. It also uh, it contained the wire transfers, uh, the names, the addresses, uh, the addresses of the companies, the addresses of the people that were running the, uh, these accounts. And one of the uh, business accounts was of the bank owner's son. He didn't publish the bank owner's account because he was still uh, counting on getting the transom. So he didn't want to anger the bank owner directly. He, he just wanted to, uh, to show that he has uh, the data. So uh, the second press release uh, after that incident said that none of the bank's clients lost any amount of money. And this is true. Uh, well, it was supposed to be true. And can any of you guess why they didn't lose any money? Uh, yeah, insurance. Exactly. The bank paid back all the money that were illegally transferred from their accounts. Uh, but that's not the case. Then comes one of the clients, and he says, well, my money was stolen, but it wasn't in, that, in your bank, so you cannot like refund it to me because it was in a different bank. And it's really interesting because uh, uh, it's interesting for the part when um, people, uh, well, the attackers um, have to attack both your phone and your Windows PC to get an access to your to your account to make a wire transfer, right? So they have to have the second factor authorization. But what we increasingly see in the botnets is that the guys try to do as much as they can with only your login and your password. And this is one of the cases where they only used login and password and they didn't use a second factor because they didn't have to use the second factor. And it all starts with the fact that in Poland, if you want to do a wire transfer, it's slow. There are three wire transfer sessions per day, and it only works on work days. So if you want to do an instant one-click shopping, that's not a good thing for the store because the client may uh, finally well, come to their senses and don't make the purchase because he can cancel a wire transfer. So instead, we, uh, the companies developed a scheme that would make it possible to make an instant payment. And well, the, as you can see, the oh, one color of the uh, pig bank represents one bank, and the second one represents the second bank. So what happens? Uh, if cl client has an account in one of the banks, he can transfer immediate, immediately uh, money to another account in the same bank. So it happens right away. And then the sec uh, from the second account, the uh, payment broker has uh, an information that he received a wire transfer, and he sends a wire transfer, uh, that information to his account in a second bank and sends it uh, almost immediately to the shop. So it happens in like a couple of minutes or something. And this scheme is working while everyone is using it in Poland and it's working uh, more or less flawlessly, except for some cases. So uh, can any one of you see where this is going or not? Uh, 
So the payment uh, processor guy, uh, sorry, oh yeah. So uh, the the flow that they used was that the payment broker had a backup account in the same bank. So he had two accounts, one that he used for this scheme and the other one that he didn't use at all. So uh, the attacker got a login and password for uh, this payment broker and he um, sent a wire transfer from, he bought something online, he got, uh, well, all that is needed to complete the wire transfer and instead of transferring his own money, he transferred money from the main account to the backup account and then back from the backup account to the main account with the correct wire transfer details. Uh, it was only based on a wire transfer title. It wasn't based on the sender address. So this only the, there was a flow also in the system. So he sent it with the correct title, sent it back. The broker got the information that the wire transfer with a correct title uh, appeared on his account and he sent the money to the shop. And he did it like you can do it continuously because you're just transferring money between two accounts and it's all the same money. And you don't have to have a second factor authentication because uh, the banks figured that if you transfer money between your own accounts, you don't have to uh, receive a text message or you don't have to use the token or you don't have to use the second factor authentication. So he actually didn't stole any money from that bank. He just transferred it between two accounts, but he stole the client's money in different banks that uh, the client sent to the online shops and he, well, he got what he bought in an online shop. So the money, despite the fact that uh, uh, bank stat statement said that uh, any, any of the clients didn't uh, lose any money, this client has. And now for the final part, and this is my uh, favorite citation from the whole PR thing that happened. Spokesman for Polish Bank Association said that the hacker who allegedly broke into bank system will be captured. So they still said that there is an alleged attack that is not real, there wasn't any attack, but the person who did it will be captured. Yeah, so there wasn't any attack, but we will find the responsible people. Um, they did capture. Uh, the, they did capture him. The the police did. The the police said that they captured the guy that was responsible for that attack. But I don't think even today, if you ask the bank, they will uh, say that there was an attack. And what what also happened is that people were constantly spamming their social media, Facebook, Twitter, and so on, and uh, they just removed the comments. So they didn't respond to any of it, they just removed it. And for the, my final slide, I'm just finishing. This is the test production server. I don't know what exactly test production means, but test production server. Uh, a couple of weeks after the attack, you can still see the password and the login data for MySQL account and in this pretty error message. And it happened, well, it was a few weeks after the attack. So uh, maybe there really wasn't an attack and they didn't notice it. Yeah, uh, thank you. I don't know if we have time for questions. So. Half a question. <laughs> One, no. two, three. Okay. Thank you, Lukasz. Thank you.